And I see all my clients and they all say the same thing. I'm waiting for motivation. You know what? Motivation doesn't go, here I am. I'm motivation. I'm at your door and I've come to motivate you. You are firing new neurons. The mind loves newness. It needs newness. Think of your mind like a Ferrari and think of you like a hugely competent, highly skilled Ferrari driver. So here's the classic mistake that comes up again and again and again. I see all my clients and they all say the same thing. I'm waiting for motivation. You know what? Motivation doesn't go, here I am. I'm motivation. I'm at your door and I've come to motivate you. That never happens. Waiting to be motivated is a huge, big, classic mistake. You have to take action to become motivated. You see, I don't love going to the gym. I don't really love running, but I never wait for the motivation to run or go to the gym to come. I know if I get on that machine and start to work out, I become motivated. I have a Pilates machine in my house. I have exercise equipment to my house. I have a boat right outside my house, a kayak that I could go on every day. But if I don't take the first action, pick up my paddle, get on that paddleboard, get in that kayak or stand on my Pilates reformer, I won't do it. And often I go, you know what? I'm really not in the mood. I'm going to do five minutes on the reformer. And the five minutes becomes 25 minutes because when I start, I keep going. I know most of you have had this experience. Oh, I don't really want to tidy the house, but I, I'm just going to do one little thing. I've put it off all day. Let me start to do the laundry, try, tidy up the house, pick up stuff. And as you do it, you feel so good that you do more. Here's another thing I see with many people who say, I'm not motivated to have sex. A lot of women say to me, no, I'm not really motivated. I've got so much to do make the kids lunchbox, put out the kids clothes, walk the dog, tidy up the house, do the dishes. I feel like the last thing on my list is have sex with my husband. I don't want to tick that list. It's just another to do. But then they said, but you know what? I decided to have sex and the weirdest thing happened. I said, oh, I'm really into this. This is actually very nice. And as I began to have sex, I became motivated to really enjoy the sex, whether it's sex, or running or tidying up, you do not become motivated until you take action. You know, I've written five best-selling books and I know you don't wake up and go, oh, I'm so motivated to sit on my desk and write and write and write. You have to sit on your desk and go, you know, I'll just do some spell check. I'll just look at some chapters. I just do that. And then what happens is because you are taking action, because I'm taking action to just think, well, I'll just spell check and grammar check and look at the layout and the formatting. And as I do that, I suddenly become so motivated to write more. So if you want motivation, never, ever, ever wait for it to turn up at your door or in your living room, indeed in your bedroom or in your gym, because it won't. But when you take the first bit of action, suddenly you are motivated. Motivation begins when you take the action that you don't want to take. It's fine to go, you know, I don't really want to go to the gym, but I'm going. I don't really want to clean up my house. I'm doing it. I don't want to go through these emails or do my taxes or write out this speech, but I'm doing it. I'm not even in the mood today for sex, but I'm doing it anyway. And please don't think I'm saying you should have sex when you don't want to. I'm saying in a relationship with a person where you love each other, sometimes you think, well, you know, I could. Why not? Really in the mood, but I'm going to get in the mood. So I get in a lot of trouble saying, oh, you've just told me to have sex and I didn't want to. No, I haven't. I've told you that if you begin sex in a loving relationship, you'll often find that you start to like it and enjoy it because... Motivation follows action. It comes after action, not before. So remember, if you're waiting for motivation to turn up, it may never turn up. But if you take the action that you would like the motivation to give, if you do it first, 
all of a sudden, everything clicks into place. You take action. In taking action, you become motivated and then you keep going. We've all done this. I, suddenly, I thought, well, I just do 10 minutes of stretching. I've been working out for an hour. I thought I just tidy up one drawer. I blitz the whole house. Suddenly, I'm motivated to really work on my business, work on my website, call my clients, do things because instead of waiting for motivation to appear, I took the first steps. And here's something else that will really help you to be motivated. You must say, I like it, I want it, I have chosen it. I know as a writer waking up thinking, oh no, I've got to write that book today. Oh, I'd rather be anywhere than here doesn't work because all of a sudden I have an overwhelming desire to tidy up the sock drawer, make all the silverware in order, straighten the cushions. Because what did I tell my mind? Oh no, I don't want to do this. My mind's job is to do what I tell it and to take me away from what I tell it I don't want to do. So I get up and go, I love writing. I want to write. There is nowhere, nowhere, nowhere I'd rather be right now than writing this book. I recently met a runner and he said, you know, I run up this hill every day and I always hate it. And at the end I go, I can't take another step. But then I started to listen to you, and I started to go, I love running up this hill. I adore running up this hill. It thrills me. What was amazing is not only did he run up that hill, he ran down and up again. He said, I used to dread the count of a hundred to get to the top of the hill. Now I'm getting up to 200. And I know the same thing when I'm working. I go, okay, I've only got 20 sit-ups to do. And I think, I do another 20 now. I've only got... 15 lunges left and as I get to the last one I think well why don't I do another 15. We can cope with anything we know there's an ending and we motivate ourselves when we take action but as, as well as taking the action you have to go I want it, I love it, I've chosen it, I like it, I like it, I like it, I want it, I want it, I want it and I recently met a writer who said you know I found writing the most excruciating, lonely isolating things to do. And think of those words, excruciating, lonely, isolating. He said, but I listened to you and I said, actually, it's thrilling. It's engrossing. It's absorbing. It's rewarding. I worked with a model once and she said, you know, being a bikini model, it is torture. It's excruciating. I said, why? She goes, well, people look at my body. And I thought, isn't that interesting that she'd say being a bikini model is excruciating, agony and torture. We all know it's not torture. It's certainly not excruciating, it's not agony. But the words you use define how you feel. Your words shape your reality. Take action, begin motivation, use the right words. I love it, I want it, I've chosen it. And finally, this one sentence, should you choose to use it, will change your entire life. I have chosen this. And I've chosen to feel great about it. I've chosen to spend all weekend working on my business and there's nowhere else I'd rather be. I've chosen to write a book, write a speech, work on something, send it out. There's nothing else I'd rather do. I've chosen to work out. And while I work out, I keep saying, I love it. I love it. My body loves the sit-ups. My legs love these lunges. My arms love these pull-ups. It's what I call lie, cheat, and steal. Lie to your mind, cheat, failure, steal back success. You know what to do. Take action first. Don't wait. Use powerful, exciting words. So what is neurobics? Well, neurobics means doing something new. I tell everyone the mind is brutal. It has a use it or lose it. And when you use your mind constantly, you find new neurons all the time, which is why professors of 85 have almost the same brain capacity of someone of 35. But we have this excuse, oh, I'm too old now. It's normal to forget things. It's my age when actually little tiny kids forget things. Go to a school and you'll see every day on the peg Someone's forgotten their coat, their lunch, their swimming stuff. But we start to think, well, yeah, I'm, I'm tired, I'm forgetful, it's my age. It's not your age, it's because you are not 
using neurobics. If you look at a child, they color, they get up, they're going to do something else, they come back, they're always doing something new. And new means use it or lose it. You have to train your brain to stay young and active and sharp. And there are many people of 95 with super sharp minds and other people of 60 who are letting their mind kind of wither away. And if you put all your work into having a great fit, young looking body, but you're forgetful, there's no point in that. If I could choose how to age, I would choose to mentally age really, really well, because then I could say, well, I'm 95 and I'm alert and I'm wide awake. What's the point of having a great body when I can't remember anything or focus or concentrate? But you can have it all, you can have a fit body and a fit mind if you use neurobics. And here's the great thing about neurobics, you don't have to go to the gym no membership is required, no hour of doing press-ups and lifting heavy weights and doing lunges is required, and it doesn't hurt. You go, oh, my stomach aches now, and it's really hard work doing all these chest raises. It takes five minutes, it's free, it's easy. So let me show you what neurobics is. It means new, but it also means the wrong hand. Most people are right-handed. If you're left-handed, you're going to have to reverse this. If you're right-handed like me, what you need to do is clean your teeth with the other hand. It feels kind of weird, but that doesn't matter. And even better, when you clean your teeth with the other hand, balance on one leg for a minute, for 30 seconds, but do something with the other hand. When you reach for your phone, use the other hand. Notice how much you use this predominant hand. For most of us, it's our right hand. We use our right hand to reach for things, to comb our hair, to pick up our phone. Train yourself to use the other hand. Every day, reach for something with the other hand and know that every time you do that, you are making yourself younger. And here's something amazing. Wherever you start from in your house, you will always, if you're right-handed, start up the stairs using your right leg. Wherever you start from, it's quite fun to try. You will always go up the stairs first on this right leg. Make yourself lead from the left. Get to the stairs and put your left foot on the stair first because you are firing new neurons. The mind loves newness. It needs newness. So do some new things. Clean your teeth with the wrong hand and balance on one leg just for a minute when you clean your teeth. Reach for your phone, your paper, your cup, your spoon with the wrong hand. Use the wrong hand. Start going up the stairs using the wrong leg, the unfamiliar leg. And finally, and this is really easy, if you do a crossword puzzle every day, because these things are really good for your brain, crossword puzzles, Sudoku, mind games, anything new. If you're learning something new, like a new language, doing anything that's different is great for your mind. Playing card games. I, my husband and I just bought this Monopoly card game. We found it last year in Bali. Our friends are playing it. And ever since, we play it a lot. It's so good for you. But if you are doing a crossword or a Sudoku, do it on your iPad. Do it on your phone. Do it on your laptop because it feels different. It's like, oh, I've got to use this differently. I've got to fill it all in differently. It's very good for your mind. Please remember, use it or lose it. If you don't want to lose it, who wants to lose their faculties? Use it. People say to me, wow, Marissa, you have the most amazing memory. I can talk to a client I saw 25 years ago and remember everything about them. And that's because I practice neurobics every day. I love it. It's easy. And my dad died at 89 and he was so sharp, sharp as a tack. I plan to be like that when I'm 102 and you can be too. So make your new year, your neurobics new year, new year neurobics on New Year's Day or before decide, hey, this is my resolution. How cool, it's so easy. I can't really break it because all I got to do is reach for my phone with that hand, clean my teeth with that hand, pick stuff up with that hand, start walking up the stairs with that leg 
and find something new, a card game, a board game, it doesn't matter, a language, play an instrument, anything you can do, take up drawing, doodling, it doesn't matter what it is, but if you do something new, that's neurobics, and the wrong hand is neurobics, new year, neurobics, new you, having a fantastic mind where you're as sharp as a tack and you can have that forever once you do neurobics. This involves you writing stuff down, so be prepared to pause the video a lot because I'm going to tell you the truth. When you have a goal in your head, it's not even a goal. It's a fantasy. It's a dream. When you have a book like this, and you can call it your goal book, and you write out your goals and you go through it. I'm just about to take you through bit by bit, stage by stage. You go back to that book. You can look at it. You can touch it. You can just make it real. So remember, if you do not write out your goals as a plan and write out how to accomplish them, you don't have a goal. You have a wish, you have a dream, you have a daydream. If you want to go get a pen, get a nice little book like this, you can do it on your phone too. You can make a document in your computer and be prepared to make your goals real. So let's start now. Get your book. Pause this if you need to go and find one, create one. And I want you to pick a goal and do not even start with, I want to lose five pounds, I want more money. These are what I call wishy-washy goals. No. If you can make your goals real, you might as well make them huge, big, enormous, phenomenal. So if you say, well, I want more money, that's my goal. Oh, hang on a minute. Hey, I got $10 here. There you go. You go, well, that's not my goal. But you said... I want more money. And I learned this when I used to work with women who were infertile that come in and go, you know, I just want to be pregnant. I want to be pregnant so bad. If I was just pregnant, I go, well, as I look at your notes, you've been pregnant six times. I know, I keep miscarrying. So being pregnant is not your goal, is it? What? Isn't your goal to carry to full term a healthy, robust, bouncing baby, to deliver a perfect baby, to be a great mum. Yeah, that's my goal. Well, why don't you say that? Because you can be pregnant lots of times and never have a baby, or you can say, my goal is to have a perfect baby. How about this? My goal is to get lots of attention. For what? A nervous twitch? Explosive gas? That will give you attention, but that's not what you want, is it? Nobody wants explosive gas. So let's start with a big goal. Pause if you need to. Take some time, open your book, and write out a big goal. Now you can have a career goal on whatever. I'm going to have my own company, create my own business, invent something. You can have a relationship goal. My relationship is wonderful. We grow in loving and respecting each other. And you can have a health goal. But I want you to pick one, only one, not three, not five, not ten. One goal, it can be career, it can be health, it can be love. Pick one goal. And then I want you to decide why you want that goal so much. So the first thing is, I have a goal. I want to have my own business. That's my goal. And now you're going to go to a next page and write out why do you want to have your own business so much? And the more reasoned you can write out why, the more likely you will make that goal real. So write down why, write down as many whys as you can. And remember, you can come back any time to this and think, oh, I thought of another why and another why. So leave plenty of space, take your time. And when you've done your whys, go to another page and write out who will benefit from you achieving that goal. Of course you will, but who? Who will benefit? For instance, if you have your own business, you will employ people who will benefit. Maybe your kids will go to private school. Maybe your business will allow you to help your partner have their business. The more people who will benefit from you achieving your goal, the more reasons you have to achieve that goal. So write out who will benefit from you achieving a who, how, and why will they benefit? You're going to buy your mama a house, put your niece and nephew through private school. Do you think of your mind as like the genie in a bottle that says, your wish is my command? 
And I want you to understand that every thought you think and every word you say is a blueprint that your mind, body, and psyche must make real. So when you write out your goals, don't say, I wish I could be rich. I long to be in a loving relationship. Write it as if it's already happening. I am a millionaire. I am in a loving relationship. You might go, well, that doesn't make sense. It does make sense because your mind only works in the present tense. When you say next year, I'll have a bikini body, it doesn't know what next year is. And so you must write your goals in the present tense. I am, I always, I have, I do. You must use words that make a picture. I want more money where well, you can find 10 cents or a dollar. But you have to say, no, I want more money. I am making a phenomenal amount of money. I am making a million dollars because I monetize a gift I have, or I make $10 million a year because I monetize a skill, then you have to make it detailed. You have to give your mind an image to go towards. What you want wants you. What you are moving towards is moving towards you, but you must have an image. So you could say, I'm going to write a best-selling book. You could go, I am writing a best-selling book and it is all about X and it's full of Y and the reason people love it is because and the reason people buy it is and when it gets reviewed they say this and you see you're making your goal real, you're making it tangible, you're giving your mind a very clear picture to go towards. So let's go further. So let's turn to another brand new page. And remember, we're always starting on this page. So that page is free and that page is free for more. This new page is about your discipline. How many hours a day are you going to spend working on your goal? How often are you going to come back to this book and look at it? I want you to write out, I am, I am always, I have, I do, and I want you to fill that in. You see, the best goal in the world will not work if you don't work. And many people fail at this point. They write out a goal. My goal is to be a millionaire. My goal is to be famous. My goal is to be wildly in love. And they think that's it. It's not it. If you want to be madly in love, write out all the reasons why, but then you have got to put yourself in front of the kind of person you want to share your life with. If you want to start your own business and you have a reason why, you also need to have the discipline to meet people who will fund you, sponsor you, joint venture with you. So I want you to really understand that the best goal will not work if you don't work. You can have the start point. But you have to keep going. Many of the most successful people I ever say, well, you know, I had a goal. Luther Vandross had a goal to be a rock star. And people said, well, you're an overnight success. He went, I don't think so. You know, I sang jingles for KFC for 12 years. That's a long night, 12 years. And people said, but Luther, you're singing on television. That's cool. You get paid a lot of money for KFC. He said, yeah, but it's not my goal. And he stuck it out and many people have got so close to success and had to keep going. And you have to keep going. So look at your discipline and decide you will give more to your goal. Give even more. Work on it. Look at it. Write it out. Think about it. Talk about it. You must be prepared to give so much to your goal. In fact, you must be prepared to be unstoppable in the pursuit of your goal. When I wrote my first book, I took it to several publishers and some rejected it. And I still remember that feeling, authors never forget it, the thud. I sent my manuscript off, I could hear the thud, it came back. They never send back the manuscript unless they don't want it, and that was okay. But then I heard the thud again, and then I heard the thud again. And when you hear the thud for the fifth and sixth times, it's like, oh no, they're sending back my book. J.K. Rowling, do you know how many times Harry Potter got rejected? Her goal was to write a best-selling book. She heard the thud over and over again. Every time she heard the thud, she picked that book up. She put it back in an envelope and she sent it back. 
You said, you know, I had a little plastic covering and I had no money. And I bought this special little cover and I put the manuscript in it and I made it look so nice. And they send it back without it. And I had to go and buy that cover again. But she was tenacious. She kept going. She got rejected. She came back. You must come back from rejection. You must see a denial and a no as a delay. You must have what I call a bounce back factor, like a big rubber ball, you bounce back. Writers have had their work rejected. Desperate housewives, they were told that would never make it. The Sopranos, people said that will never make it. It's too violent, it's not funny. It happened to become one of the most successful TV series of all time. And if you knew, even Gone with the Wind, they were said that will never make it. So many things we buy, like Trunky, the little children's suitcase, Tangle teasers, were told this, this won't make it, you won't make it. Many people you see out there who've made it have been told no many, many, many times, but they come back and they come back. You must not allow rejection to stop. You must understand the only person who can ever, ever, ever reject you is you. And if you don't reject, you no one can. My husband owned a chain of comedy stores and one day a comedian went up and he told the joke, it was funny, it all went downhill. And when he came off, my husband was waiting and he said, did you see how much they loved the first joke? And I loved that because he didn't focus on the fact they didn't like any of the others. He held on to they liked the first one and he knew he could take that and have lots more first ones. And you can do that too. So let's go to another page. This is really, really important. I want you to work on your self-belief and confidence. Write out what kind of confidence you will need to have to achieve that goal. What beliefs do you need to believe to achieve that goal? You know, someone said to Michael Jordan, you're so lucky. He said, I know the more I train, the luckier I become because you make your own luck. Write out your beliefs, write out the confidence you will give to yourself because you can fill yourself up with confidence. You were born with it, you haven't lost it, you've just buried it under limiting beliefs. You can remove those. Let's go to another page and this is really important. You are worth it. You might go, look, that's just the same as the other page. Not quite. And even if it was, I want you to exhaust yourself with writing. You may just say, I've only written three lines, it's fine, but tomorrow you might think of another one and come back. Why are you worth it? Why do you deserve this goal? What makes you worth it? Why do you know you're worth it? How do you know you are worth it? And if you don't know, how are you going to know that you are worth it? You must believe you're worth it. You must know you're worth it. When you know it, the world will join you in knowing it too. Remember, pause the video. Please don't try and keep up with me. This is serious. I want you to pause, write, unpause, write more. I want you to do this. Most people listen to these tutorials, but this is not something to listen to. It's something to participate in. Do it with me. I'm doing this for you. I want you to have phenomenal success. And while you're writing, I'm going to tell you something you probably already know. There were many studies in the 50s where they took a group of graduates and said, how many of you have goals and how many of you write them down amazingly, I think. This is not word for word, so please don't quote me, but I pretty much know this. I believe 3% of that graduating year had goals and wrote them out. A higher percentage had goals and didn't write them out, and another group had no goals at all. They went back 20 years later, 30 years later. The wealth of the 3% who had goals and wrote them out was worth more than the other 97% combined. Not only did they have monetary goals that they'd reached, they had better relationships, better health, and all of this was attributed right back to one thing. They had goals, they wrote them out, and they wrote out how to achieve them, 
why to achieve them, what it would feel like when they achieved them, who would benefit when they achieved them. They didn't probably do all of that, but that's what I make my clients do. And if you do it, you know that you can have that success because that test has been done more than once. It was done again in the 1980s. It was done again in the 1990s. And we're doing it today. Write out your goals, write out your why, write out your reasons, write out what you are going to learn, the new things you're going to learn. If you're going to be a writer, you're going to be a speaker. If you're going to have your own business, you better learn accountancy and so on and so on. If you're going to sell, you need to learn how to speak. If you want to be a great anything, you need to learn marketing. I train people into be being phenomenal therapists. I tell them the truth, look, it doesn't matter how amazing you are if nobody knows where you are. In most of our businesses, we must learn marketing, search engine optimization. I didn't know any of those things, I do now. I wrote a book called Trying to Get Pregnant and Succeeding. I never liked that title but it is the most searched for title on the web, trying to get pregnant. So I called my book a title I didn't even agree with because I don't use the word trying. I use the word doing. But I understood that what people search for. I don't like the word losing weight. I don't like the word losing, but people search for that word. So you're gonna have to learn marketing, technology, IT, social media. And that's good because the more things you learn, the better you'll be. Mick Jagger studied accountancy after he was a multi-millionaire because he wanted to know where his money was going. And he's very smart. You can do that too. So let's finish with our last few pages. You're worth it. What are you learning? And now I want you to write out on this new page that you are going to act it, talk it, think it, speak it. What will you do differently? I want you to act as if your goal has already happened. I am a best-selling author. I have my own successful business. I am a fabulous entrepreneur. I am an inventor. You need to say it in the same way all the women I met who couldn't conceive, I made them go, I'm expecting a baby that I'm not. Look, you're expecting a tax bill, aren't you? You're expecting a phone call. It's not there, but it's coming. You can expect a baby. You are in a state of expectancy. So I want you to think, how would you talk? How would you dress? How would you speak? What would you do? How would you spend your free time? when you have achieved those goals. Write all of that out. It's a lot of writing, I know, but remember, until you write it, it's not even real. So write all these things. You're going to have faith, courage, and I want you to write out some of the risks you are going to take. And here's the truth. The only risk in life is not to take the risk. I rang up a publisher and said, would you like to look at my book? They said, no. I sent it to them anyway. Someone had told me that in publishing, if you write on the envelope, this is not an unsolicited manuscript, they accept it. So I sent it in and they accepted it. But I also heard the thud when it came back. But I had to take the risk. I had to ring a publisher and say, would you publish my book? I had to ring an agent and say, would you be my agent? Many people said, no, no, no successful hear rejection and they keep going so what risk are you going to take you're going to stand up and talk about it it's like people who go on shark tank and dragons and they get laughed off and some of them become so successful anyway the only risk in life is not to take the risk if you take a risk and it doesn't work you learn something we all know that colonel parker i don't know how many Kentucky Fried Chicken recipes he submitted until he submitted the right one. And it's not important. It's only important that you keep going. How many fails Edison had before he created a light bulb, but he kept going. So, plan it, want it, write it, work on it, 
know you're worth it and see it as if it was already happening. So don't say one day I will, in the future, next year, in five years, now. I am becoming X now. This is happening in my life now, right now. And when you've finished, well done, but this is not finished. I want you to go back every day, read what you've written, maybe add a little bit more. And as you read it, more ideas will come up, more ideas will come up. Here's something that happens. When you do something to make your goal real, something happens, something shifts. So my story very quickly is that I always wanted to write, but I wasn't sure I could. And then I wrote an article for my daughter's school paper. That was really easy. Everybody loved it. I decided to write a book. I went to an event, sat next to a girl. We were talking and she told me she was a publisher for Penguin. And she gave me her card, but then she happened to say that she was moving to Hong Kong in six weeks. So I took her card, put it in my bag, and six weeks when I knew she'd left, I called her number and asked her, and they said, she's not, she's left. I went, oh, she asked me to send my book draft, and they went, really? I said, oh yes, I've got her card here, and she asked me to send my book. They went, okay, well look, send it, but you must write on it. This is not an unsolicited manuscript, because if you don't, we won't open it, so I sent it to them. I sent it to lots of other publishers too. I took that risk. You see, someone put me in front of that woman. The universe conspired as I took the courage to write my book. The universe put me next to a publisher. And then I went to a dinner party, I met an agent, and one of my clients said, well, you know the best agent in town? He's your client. I'm like, really? They went, yeah, and I went, oh, and I called him. He came to me and he was my client. I treated him for depression long ago and he became my agent. I didn't need an agent. I've got a book deal already because Penguin took my book. He said, I will get you five times what they're offering you. And he did. All these things happened. All these unforeseen events came out because of my commitment to do something. The minute you commit to something, to your goal book, write it, read it, touch it. The minute you commit to it, the universe works with you all kinds of unforeseen, amazing things will be put in your way, right in front of you, because you committed. Everything will fall into place. Things will happen. Coincidence means two angles that fit together perfectly. All because you took action. Your book is your action. Write in it, read it, look at it. Fortune favors the brave. Be brave, be courageous, be bold, have big goals, and you know what? I bet you achieve them. Let me know. The success is not about never failing. It's not about never having setbacks. It's about how quickly you bounce back, how quickly you get back up. And I have found that the fastest way to stop spiraling and to get back up is to tell yourself that you have phenomenal coping skills. Many years ago, I worked with a girl who really had a challenging life. In fact, her mother's saying was this, I can't cope. They never went to the cinema or even the store. The mother couldn't cope with light or sound. She was light sensitive, noise sensitive. If you opened a packet of potato chips, it would make her react. Because of the mother's words were, I can't cope, can't cope with the noise, can't cope with the mess, can't cope with anything. My client grew up with the belief, I can't cope. And she had such an inability to cope that she ended up being hospitalized. And then she was a day patient, and then I began to treat her. And she said, you know, every week I have to go for therapy. And we sit in a circle and we have to say something good. And when it's my turn, I tend to go, well, today I saw some daffodils, it made me smile, or... Yesterday I saw some bees and I felt good and I'm like, no, forget the bees and the daffodils. This is what you are going to say when it's your turn in the group to speak. You are going to say, I have phenomenal coping skills. And next week you're going to say, I have extraordinary coping skills. And next week you're going to say, I have amazing coping skills. You're going to say it in that group. You're going to write it on your mirror. You're going to say it every day. It's going to become 
not just your affirmation, but your statement of truth. I promise you, if you say it, you send a message to your mind. And by the way, your mind does not care if what you're telling it is good or bad, right or wrong, useful or useless, helpful or not helpful, or doesn't care. You know why? It doesn't even know. So you can choose whether to go, I can't cope, or you can choose to go, I have amazing coping skills. I can't cope, I have awesome coping skills. You get to choose. You know what you can't choose? What you do to your body when you go, I can't cope, this is driving me crazy. I'm at the end of my rope, I'm at my maximum bandwidth, I just can't cope. I can't cope because it's not true. Human beings are actually resilient. And the fastest way to stop yourself spiraling out of control, the fastest way to stop believing that events is all gone wrong. My flight got cancelled, my contract got cancelled, my partner left me, my child got sick, I can't pay my bills, I'm losing it, I'm sinking, I'm drowning in debt, I'm sinking into grief, I can't deal anymore. The fastest way to stop that is to have some amazing sentences. I have extraordinary, phenomenal, incredible, enviable, exemplary coping skills sends an incredible message to your mind that doesn't think, doesn't argue, doesn't disagree, just goes, hey, whatever you say, your mind is the genie, your wish is its command. When you say, I have amazing coping skills, your words shape your reality and it becomes real because it's not the events that affect you. It's the meaning you attach to the event. It's not pressure. It's not people. It's your beliefs. So going back to my client, let me call her Annabelle. That wasn't her name, but We'll pretend it was. Annabelle came back and said, you know, it's amazing. I say that all the time. I even sing that song from The Muppets, phenomenal, da 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 phenomenal, da 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 I sing, I'm phenomenal. And it's just so in my head. I sing it, say it, speak it, think it. And I feel amazing. But you know what else has happened? The nurse said to me, Annabelle, the other patients also would like to say, they have phenomenal coping skills. Is that okay? She went, well, it's not my word. Marissa told me to say it. It's a word I use all the time, by the way. So she said, sure. So they all began to say it in turn, different versions of it. And then the ward put up posters all around. You have amazing coping skills. You are a phenomenal coper. And they said that that ward, that group, if you like, had the fastest discharge and the fastest recovery. So I invite you to do the same. Be a coper. Tell yourself, I can cope with whatever life throws at me. Whatever's in my path, I cope with it because I'm a coper. Not only am I a coper, I'm a phenomenal coper, an extraordinary coper. I have phenomenal coping skills. You see, if your belief is I'm gonna be perfect, I'm gonna find a perfect person, have a perfect home, raise perfect kids and have a perfect job. You know what you'll be? Disappointed. Perfection doesn't exist. In 33s, I can tell you that my clients who keep trying to be perfect are not only the unhappiest and the most dissatisfied, they are also the loneliest because we don't want someone who's perfect. We want someone who is real. We want someone who can cope because that's a great thing. Oh, I can cope and you can cope and let's cope with life together. Let's take the good and the bad and let's just have a great life with our great coping skills. So let's imagine that you use the word, I can't cope. I'm in overwhelm. That's a new word. I'm in overwhelm. I'm overwhelmed. If you tell your mind that you can't cope, then you need something to help you cope. That may be drugs. It may be medication, it may be alcohol, it may be food. Because you've told yourself, I can't cope, and because your mind takes everything you say as literal, 
It's now going to look outside of you for something that makes you cope. I was working with a girl recently who had a very bad drug problem and I told her something. I said, you know what, drugs are for people who can't cope with reality. Reality is for people who can't cope with drugs. And she laughed and said, I never thought about that. Drugs are for people who can't cope with realities. If I cope with reality, that means I don't need drugs, of course. Rather, like when we're in grief, we go, I need medication. I need something to take away the pain. I need a pill. I need a drink. You see, it's a belief. It's an action. I need something out there. Medication, drugs, drinks, cigarettes, cakes. I need something out there because I've just told myself I can't cope in here. In fact, when you can cope in here, you don't need anything out there. And you can cope with grief as painful as it is. You can cope with loss. You can cope with setbacks. Because when you medicate, when you push them down with a massive tub of ice cream or with some drugs or with some alcohol, when you push them down, they don't go away. They regroup and they come back stronger than ever. All of my clients and antidepressants say, you know, it doesn't work. One of my clients came to me and said, I can't have sex with my husband. So I went to my doctor, he put me on Prozac. You know what's happening now? I still can't have sex, but I don't care. I'm just so numb. I don't care. Something was driving me crazy. Now I'm on medication and I'm just numb. I'm not up, I'm not down, I'm numb. You don't really want to be comfortably numb. You want to feel. And joy and pain are like the weave of a cloth. You can't have one without the other. We can have moments of immense joy, but there's also pain. Our parents will probably get old and die. We will get old and die. Things happen. But when you believe I can cope with anything life puts in front of me, then you can indeed cope. I lost both my parents and one of my dearest friends all in the same three month period. That was hard, but I was just so glad I had my parents for such a long time. I was so glad I got to be with them at the end and talk to them and say goodbye. And my father was saying, I've had a wonderful life. I've had such a great life. It's been an amazing life. He was a coper. My mother had a very different passing. And I felt no pain when my father died. Apart from I missed him, I felt a lot of pain about my mother because my mother wasn't a coper. My father was. My father decided he'd had an amazing life and my mother didn't quite think the same thing. Be a coper. You get to choose. Remember, you can choose to be a coper. You can choose to believe you're not a coper, but you can't choose what believing you are not a coper does to your body, to your adrenals, to your cortisol levels. When you believe you are a coper, everything is easier. So be a coper all the time. Your mind does what it thinks you want it to do. This is probably one of the most powerful rules of the mind. Here's your mind's job. It's got a very clear job. I'm your mind and I'm gonna do what I think you want. And when you say, oh, this commute is killing me, my boss makes me want to die, my kids are making me go up the wall, I am stressed out of my mind by the freeway, your mind goes, oh, you keep telling me that something is killing you, it appears to be your job or your commute, why don't I just give you a lovely ulcer and then you can stay home and avoid that place that's killing you? It's, that's its job. Why don't you do your job and talk to your mind better? The commute is a pain, but I have great CDs to listen to. I have stuff to do. My boss is difficult with everyone. It's not me. He's not there and I'm having sex with my wife. He's not in the room and we're having a lovely dinner. This is temporary. He's an unhappy person. Do it better. You will get what you want when you tell your mind what you want. But here come the words. Let's imagine you're going to give a speech and the words are, oh my God, I'm freaked out. I'm, I'm terrified. I, I'm going to go bright red out of my mouth and go, oh, I, I haven't got the time right. I, I, I'm so nervous. Your mind goes, do not get on that stage. If you walk to that stage, I'm going to give you a massive panic in the middle of the room because you told me you don't want to do it, and I've got to do what you want. 
Or you can go, I am fantastic at speaking. I've got something to say. People like me. What I have to say is a value. Speaking to a stage is like speaking to my wife or husband. And then your mind goes, get on that stage and do it. You always have a choice, but your mind's job is to do what it thinks you want. When you go, I want a week off. Who's ever done this? What I would give for a week off lying in bed. Your mind goes, leave that with me. Now you got the flu. How cool am I? I listened to you. You wanted a week off lying around watching Netflix. Now you got it. That's not what you wanted. You need to say, I need some time. And I'm like a battery. I need to recharge. And I'm okay at working full out all week. Because at weekends, I recharge like a battery. Now your mind understands. But saying, I'd give anything not to have to chair that meeting. Mine goes, how about a nice dose of diarrhea? I can bring that up for you. You don't want to chair that meeting? You said I'd do anything not to go. I'd rather kill myself than give that presentation to my boss. And I goes, oh, don't kill yourself. I just give you a really upset stomach. Now you can't even leave the bathroom. There's no chance you're meeting your boss. You've done what you wanted. I know I'm making it funny, but it is funny that so many people don't understand your mind's job is to do what it thinks you want, and it bases that on one thing, the words you use and the pictures you put in your head. And here's some great news. You can change those words and change those pictures like that. And when you do that, it changes everything. So your mind tries to move you towards pain, away from pain and towards pleasure too. Very. I mean, so many kids are going, you know, I want to ask out this girl, I want to talk to that boy, but I'm so nervous they won't like me, and they're going to reject me and laugh at me. And, and if they keep doing that, the mind's going to go, no, don't go there, stay the way you are. So you have to say, people like me. I'm, I'm a great kid. I get all my young kids to write on their mirror, I'm an awesome kid, I'm enough. And it really changes them because they start to feel it. I'm an awesome kid. I can talk to a girl like I can talk to my friend. And then they feel okay. But if you keep linking pains on it, your mind goes, don't go there. Don't go there. And if you link pleasure to it, you go there. Because you're giving your mind an easy job. I've got to work on my website all weekend. And all my friends are in the bar, so I can link paint. That it's not fair. It's not fair that I've got to spend all weekend writing when I could be in the pub. Now your mind's going to go, I think you should tidy up your sock drawer, make sure all your forks face the right way, then plump up the cushions, and then go to the pub. Because it's very clear you do not want to work on your website. But oh boy, getting those forks and knives in line is really compelling. Who's done that? Most of us do that. I suddenly need to do the laundry, which I don't even like. I'm tidying up my house because I'm saying I don't want to write that bit of work. How about saying it thrills me to work on my website? I'm elated working on my website. There is nowhere I'd rather be in the whole world right now than sitting in my office working on my website. Your mind goes, I'm going to set you on fire now. You're going to be doing this till two in the morning. You told me you love it and it thrills you. Let me fill you up with energy and passion. I'm a writer, I know how this works. I never go, oh my God, I've got to write a book. It's so lonely, it's so isolating. And what if no one likes it? What if it goes on Amazon, they go, I hate that book, and it gets no stars? Or I can go, I love writing. How cool is it? I get to write, and people pay for my books, and they like them, and they give me great reviews, because there's the choice going on again. So whatever you want, you must link massive pleasure to what you want, and you can link pain to what you don't want, but I, I don't bother to do that. Let's think of all the pain, your book's never published, you go into your coffin, it's still in a drawer. It, you don't have to do that, just focus on the pleasure bit. I'm a writer, it's amazing, my book is published. I used to always imagine my book in stores. I'd imagine going to an airport, see people reading my book. And when I did, it was like, wow, but your mind went, well, I took you there because you showed me very clearly what you wanted. I had that image to take you to because what you want, wants you. And what you are moving towards is moving towards you. Don't move towards fear. Don't move towards failure. Don't move towards it going wrong. Move towards it going right. So we've actually done the next bit. Your mind responds to the pictures and words. The fastest way to change anything is to change the pictures and words. And it's such an easy thing to do. 
I'm terrified, I'm elated. I'm useless, I'm amazing. I have no memory, my memory is compelling. I can't speak to people, what I have to say is easy. I find it easy to speak to anyone. This is the most vexing rule of the mind for every therapist and coach in the room. It's the one my clients have the hardest time with. Your mind loves what is familiar. If your mind could choose, it would stay with what's familiar and never go to what's unfamiliar. We're in a walled city. And that's interesting because years ago at night they shut the door and we stayed in the wall. We didn't think, do you know, I feel like going for a midnight stroll. I think I'll wander around. I'm a bit bored of being in this same old, same old. I want some variety. I think I'll open the gate, wander off and find another tribe. They might have killed you or eaten you. We learned familiar made us safe. Who here notices with their kids and they literally want the same cup? The same bowl, the same cereal. I took my daughter to Finland to see Santa Claus. She watched Little Mermaid in Finnish the whole time. And she didn't, that was okay in Finnish because she knew, she'd watched it 110 times. Where I'm like, babe, here's Father Christmas, here's only mummy. I want to watch The Little Mermaid. It's like, well, next time we'll just stay home and, and watch a movie then. She did actually get into it, but it made her feel good. She used to play this game. She had so many Barbies and Ken would come up in his car and he always picked the same one. He never picked another one to go to the ball because they like familiar. It makes them safe. You know, how many kids you have, they want the same story every night. But familiar also makes us safe. So here's a rule of the mind and it's a very important rule to put into practice. My mind likes what is familiar and it doesn't like what's unfamiliar. Okay. But I can make anything negative unfamiliar and anything positive familiar. Let's start with praise. It's the most simple but the most powerful. I meet clients who are never praised. I met one girl whose dad said, you're so rubbish, just like your mother. God knows what you've got going. If any man asks you out, snap them up because you are nothing. You're not interesting, you're not attractive. When you get pregnant, you'll blow up just like her and be a big fat mess. So if anyone wants to be with you, I can't imagine why take them. And she heard that a lot. So she had this interesting belief, I've got nothing to offer the world. And I did a lot of work with her and she went out and she went, it was just amazing. It was like magic. This guy came up and he asked me out and he was so nice. I mean, he actually made another date and he picked me up in his car and took me out for dinner, told me I was amazing. I'm never seeing him again. I'm like, really? She went, no, no, he was too good for me. I'm like, oh, let's change that wording to his behavior was so unfamiliar. I don't recognize praise or niceness or somebody believing I'm worth something and I want to run back to the familiar guys. I have to beg to take me out or seeing my friends. I pay the bill and they remind me of my dad. And I'm like, well, guess what? You're not supposed to have sex with your dad. So there's a clue. If someone is like your dad, I don't think you should be getting into bed with them. And I think you need to make that unfair. The people like it when you make them laugh. So she went, right. So I said, you need to go out with this guy. And this is what you do. You keep saying, I will make this familiar. He rings me when he says he will. I make it familiar. He texts me. I'll make it familiar. I will make it familiar. And she ended up marrying him. She's very happy. She said, how weird. The other guy called me and said, what happened to me? She went, what, the guy who never called me? You never called me, so I just let you go. So you have to say, let's do it with all of you. How many of you find praise a little unfamiliar? How many of you find praising yourself even more unfamiliar? Okay, so if you're never praised and you're criticized a lot, and criticism is familiar, when someone goes, wow, I love that teacher, you go, I got it free, it's got a hole in it, I've had it eight years. I loved your speech, didn't you notice I missed out the best bit? No, I thought it was amazing. I hear you're the best salesperson in your team. Yeah, but not in my county, there's another guy way better than me. So if praise isn't familiar, you will reject praise, but you'll add in what's familiar, criticism. So that one of the best things you can do that will change your life is to make praising yourself familiar and to make criticism unfamiliar. Don't do that day in life. Oh, God, God, look at my hair. Oh, there's a stain on this jacket. I'm an idiot. Oh, I didn't buy any nice food. Now I'm going to have to eat donuts. I'm such a moron. I didn't charge my phone. I'm a retard. I haven't got enough time to get there. I'm a loser. You know, if someone said over your work, going, well, it's not very good. Look at that. You haven't even spelt it correctly. And then all the way home, they went, you haven't left enough time. You're an idiot. You haven't got any nice food. Moron. How quickly would you kick them out of your life? 
pretty fast. But when it's you, you can't kick yourself. Out of it. And when a friend is mean, you go, they're having a bad day. But when you're mean, your mind goes, well, it must be true. Everything you tell me is true. So you need to make praise familiar. It's really easy. I'm amazing, I'm kind, I'm nice, I'm real, I'm authentic, I'm a good person, I have something to offer the world, I have a unique skill. That's easy. And don't go, I'm an idiot, I'm a moron. I was telling my little girl off one day, she got very good, she said, Mommy, you are a silly billy. And I thought, well, that's a great word. So next time I'm about to say, you idiot, I go, you silly billy. Because it's just a word. If I said to my husband, oh, you silly boy, he doesn't go, how could you offend me like that? Because it's a word. It's how I say it. You're so naughty. He doesn't go, I know, I'm t- I need some therapy. I'm so bad. I go, oh, that's, you're so bad. So it, it, you can make words. So I want you to think of the worst word you have for yourself. It's always the same stupid bitch, airhead, idiot, loser. And I want you to change it to silly billy. Because when you say silly Billy, because you can't help it. I was changing a light once and my hand was wet and I nearly electrified it. And I was about to go, you stupid effing. And I went, you silly Billy, don't do that again. Because why beat yourself up? There's enough people in the world who'd like to beat you up. Why do you want to be one of them? Be nice. Show the world that you're worth it. So up praise massively and minimize criticism. If you wanted to change your life today, this will change your life Praise yourself a lot and don't criticize yourself. And if you do go, yeah, but I did something really bad, go, well, I learned. I learned from that mistake, I'll never do it again. If it taught you something, it's okay. Don't beat yourself up. You're allowed to make a mistake. You are not allowed to beat yourself up, berate yourself and call yourself names and punish your body for doing what everyone does. They make mistakes. So to make a mistake is human And to forgive yourself feels really divine. And to call yourself a silly billy feels even more divine. So that's something I recommend you all do. Whatever you focus on, you get more of. How many of you sat having an injection going, oh my God, that needle's going in and it really hurts. You notice that babies don't do that because they don't know. So whenever I have to have blood taken, I get my phone out. It's the easy and I get completely, and I go ahead and I don't really notice it. But if I look at it, It's not the same. If you focus on pain, it hurts. If you focus on stress, you're more stressed. In fact, I had a client come up to work on stage with me, and she was like this. She was shaking so much. And all my class would go, my husband like, wow, I've seen you get people out of that, but I've never seen them start with it. And she was just shaking so much. I went, okay, I want you to shake more. I want you to really shake. Come on, Gwen, you can do better than that. Shake, keep shaking, shaking, shaking. I said, you know, have you ever seen a deer pursued by a lion? When it gets away, it doesn't go, I need therapy now. This is so traumatic. It shakes. It stands and shakes and it goes back to the herd and life goes on. And when I made her shake, what was happening is she began to think, oh, I'm in control of the shaking. I'm doing it, then I can stop it. And so when clients go, my knees are knocking, go knock them together loud, I want to hear it. My hands are clammy, can you make them even more clammy? Can you turn up that sweating so you're dripping? Yeah, go on then. And then I say, you see that you're doing it. What you focus on, you get more of. When they focus on, oh, I did that, and I can turn it down, it feels better. So don't be scared of clients that shake or sweat or start to laugh. When they laugh, I go, I want you to laugh even more. I want you to almost wet yourself with laughing. Actually, I don't say that too often because that does put a bad, good picture in the mind. When people, I say, laugh more, cry more. I laugh with them. Sometimes I cry with them. Whatever you focus on, you get more of. If you ski and you focus you'll go. If you're on the freeway and you focus on an exit hard enough, you'll take it without even planning to. So whatever you focus on, you get more of. Focus on great things and you'll get more of them. The strongest force in every human being in the world is that we must act in a way that utterly matches and is completely consistent with our thinking. I know I'm going to fail. I know I'm going to mess it up. I know it's going to hurt. I know it will go wrong. Now you have zero choice but to act in a way that's consistent with your thinking. 
I know it's going to be great. I know I'm going to sail through it. I can ace this. This is easy. Change the words. It changes your whole language. But everything starts with a thought. Everything, everything, everything begins with a thought. And here's the great news. Your thoughts are yours to change. And you can change your thoughts. It's actually incredibly easy when you learn that Everything starts with a thought. A thought is a word. And if you use words elated, empowered, ecstatic, blissed out, amazing, phenomenal, incredible, I'm stellar, I'm just amazing. And you can repeat the same words over and over again. I feel ecstatic. I'm elated. When I work, they'll say, I can't stand up to my boss. I can't tell my mum that she's actually the biggest bitch in the whole world who ruined my life. I go, well, how about thinking if you say that, it makes you feel elated. It makes you empowered. It sets it free. Because outrage is just rage that needs to come out. I said to my listen, your anger is like gas. Better out than in. She's not in the room. Let's do it now. I want you to say to your mum, Mom, you know, I want to love you more, and I can't because I resent deeply. And suddenly they go, you absolute bitch, you biggest bitch in the world. How could you do that? No, though, I feel so good now because it's out, and I can go home, and I can love my mom better because I've let the resentment out. So I never tell people to keep it in. I think feelings do their most damage when they're kept in, when they're repressed and pushed down. And most of my clients who binge and drink too much are pushing down feelings. The stomach is the seat of all emotions. You can't heal what you can't feel, but you should let feelings out. And if you keep it in, you always suffer, you always feel repressed. Many clients I see who say they are depressed are not depressed. They are repressed and they are suppressed because they can't say, I resent you. For always saying about my brother who was smarter, I resent you for marrying six different guys who are hideous to me and never putting me first. And then they make their peace and then they move on. You have to be aware of it, you have to accept it, and you have to articulate it. I call it triple A. Be aware of your feelings. My ex-husband drives me crazy and I'm so angry with him, and I can't tell him because he's the father of my kid. I get that. Shut the bathroom, turn on the taps, and say, you are the biggest ass in the world. Thank God I've got a great ass, because I realize I don't need another one in my life, and make it funny. <laughs> God gave me a great ass. I don't need to marry one. I'm done with you. But say it, and then you feel better, and make it amusing, so they don't think, oh, I feel terrible. She said, I can say... I've got a great ass, I don't need to date one. And now I feel good, I remember that. They remember stuff that's funny and significant. So remember your thoughts form the blueprint. What you present to your mind, it will present back to you. When you go, I'm not enough, it goes, of course. And when you go, I am enough, it goes, of course. So we've already covered this rule that your mind doesn't care. We've covered every thought you think. Here's a great rule. When dealing with a subconscious mind, the greater the conscious effort, the less the subconscious ones. Who's tried to relax? Who's tried to sleep? Who's tried to remember? What's the name of that restaurant? I don't know. And suddenly, you think, oh my God, it's just popped in my head. Your mind actually is like Google. If you need to remember, don't go, where's my keys? Where's my keys? My passport? Oh my God, I'm going to miss the plane. I'm going to get fired. It's all a disaster. Don't do that. Say to your mind, tell me where I put my keys. Remind me where my keys are. And do something else. And it will pop in. Oh, of course, I came in and I put them next to the fridge. Tell me the name of that restaurant I went to. Do something else. Your mind will do its job. You give it an instruction. Mind, go ahead and tell me where my keys are, where my wallet is. And it will tell you. It will pop it in your head. But when you try and start, you know the thing where you empty out the drawer? And then you go and empty it out again. And now you've emptied it out three times looking for your passport. You know it's not there. But for a fourth time, let's tip our handbag on the floor. Pull out our drug. I'm missing the flight. Oh, my God. 
Everyone's going to hate me. My kids are going to be furious. Don't do that. Stress shuts down logical thinking. When you're stressed, your mind goes, there must be a lion somewhere. Let me pull all the blood away from your brain into your heart and lungs so you can run. I saw this in action years ago. I was walking home, and this guy was following me. And I lived in a basement, and I got halfway down the stairs, and I knew he was going to come down the stairs too. And I, I got my key in the door, and I couldn't work out. I thought, I've lived here for five years. I don't know how to open the door. So I was so scared. But I had the foresight to pull the key out, and I had to stand back in the shadows, flatten myself against the wall. And he came halfway down. He couldn't see me, and he left. But I wasn't going to keep trying to open that door, because when you're scared, your mind just disappears. You can't even remember your own phone number. So you have to fill up your mouth with saliva and pump it around, push your shoulders down, and then you're not stressed. But uh, it's very important when you want to remember something, don't try. Ask your mind to remind you. And if you're in an exam and you think, oh my God, my mind's gone blank, fill up your mouth with saliva, swirl it around, push your shoulders down, and your mind goes, a wet mouth is a sign of someone who's relaxed. That's why we kiss, by the way, before we have sex. A wet mouth makes you relaxed. And so... Don't do that. I can't remember. I don't know where I'm going. I'm lost on the freeway. Oh, my God, which road shall I take? I'm just panicking. Fill up your mouth with saliva and say, subconscious mind, remind me. I looked at the map. Which road is it? It will tell you because it's foolproof, but you've got to do it too. Your mind works for you. You don't work. Put it to work. I mean, if you had a PA and went, okay, I'm going out now. Just, um, just do the job. Or, hey, I'm going out to Tallinn. Could you decorate my house? Do you think you're going to come back? And they've done it right? No, you've got to go. This is exactly what I want. The more specific you are with your decorator, PA, or hairdresser, the more you get what you want. You don't go to a restaurant and go, oh, get me something to eat. I, don't, I, I didn't want that. Well, you said anything will do. You've got to talk to your mind that way, too. So... Uh, I think we pretty much got that. The mind can't hold conflicting beliefs. So let's go on to hypnotic language patterns. We have just enough time. Children can only work in the present tense. They don't understand tomorrow. My little girl said, okay, Mommy, is it tomorrow today? She didn't know what yesterday, today, and tomorrow was. She goes, is it tomorrow now? Is it tonight, today? Because they don't understand. They only understand now. That's why with a baby, when you leave the room, they think you're never coming back. And so children aren't really great at future pacing. Children can only respond to words that make pictures. The more vivid the picture, the more powerful they respond. So don't say you're a good kid. Say you are an amazing kid. What I love about you is you've got a natural gift for science. Or what I love about you is you're so good at cooking. What I love about you is how much you love learning. It doesn't matter if you don't get great grades. You love learning. The more you can make the picture good. See, I have so many kids who are twins ago. I was called twins. Twins, lunch is ready. Twins get in the car, and they had no identity. Don't do that. Don't dress your kids the same. Don't say, I love you, because you're smart. Because when you label a child, you limit them. Even a good label, I love you because you're beautiful. Kids say, and if I wasn't, you wouldn't. Don't do that. I love you because you're lovable. And when you grow up, People are going to love you. One of my clients said, I can't find love. My dad used to say to me every day, no one's ever going to love you like I do. Well, there's a program. You say to your kids, you're so lovable. You're going to find so many people who love you like I love you. So a child's mind doesn't recognize neutral words. How many people say to a baby, don't touch? And then they touch. Because don't is a new touch. They know what touch is. Don't touch. Don't touch. Keep touching it. Stop touching it. They can only hear the words touching it. So you can say that's very fragile and it's very important to mummy. As I say to my little girl, when you're walking across the house with a drink, I didn't, don't spill it. Don't, oh, look, you've spilt it now. I knew it. You always spill it. I go, darling, when you look at, when you, you've got to look at the cup and not the television. And if you look at the cup while you walk, you'll keep it up, right? And then everything will stay in the cup. They understand stuff that makes a picture. Don't spill your juice. I guarantee they're going to spill it. Every day you go, you, you, just, you just can't stop spilling it. You're just a messy kid. And four days later, they go, I'm so messy. I, I'm always spilling stuff. What's wrong with me? You are conditioned. That's what's wrong with you. But you can be unconditioned like that. So a child mind responds better to specific words and instructions. So they don't understand later. 
they do respond to positive words. You must, with children, eliminate every negative word. You're bad, you're naughty. Good kids do bad things. Smart people do silly things. Say to a child, you're a great kid. Why did you do that? That's not you. You're a good kid. And they go, well, you said you liked her more than me. No, I didn't. Well, I heard that. And so if you start with, you can't do it all the time. Our kids push our buttons. I say to Michael, you know, you're my teacher, darling. You're teaching me how to cope with someone who gets paint all over the carpet. My daughter's an artist. I'm tidy. She's messy. I wasn't designed to give birth to myself. How boring would that have been? She's nothing like me. I'm nothing like her. We learn from each other. It didn't make our life perfect, but it made it easier. So children also respond to you are, you can, you always, you do. You all know the story about the class that were given to a teacher. And the teacher said, these kids are geniuses. We predict they're the best. And you are the genius teacher. We've done these secret tests. Genius kids, genius teacher. We know you'll get genius results, which, of course, they did. And they went, well, we picked you at random, and we picked the kids at random. But if you believe something, it becomes true. So let's go on to the very last one. Children can't future pace. So when they're feeling sadness, it feels like it's going to be for the rest of their life. And they do this thing called tagging. I can't make my mommy happy. And it's always going to be this way. My, I don't have a dad. I don't have anyone to love me. It will never, ever change. We don't have enough money. It's going to be like this for the rest of my life. And so when you're working with children, I say to them something which I love. I say, look, darling, this is your life today. It's not your life. I know your dad's an alcoholic. I know your dad's in jail. I know your mom's working all the time and you live with babysitters. And I know that is your life today, but it's not your life. One day, you'll have a totally different life. They're not good at future pacing. But that one expression, it's your life today. You have no friends. I mean, I worked with a little girl who had no friends and was so bullied. And now this girl has got so many friends. Could I always say, remember, it's just your life today and probably tomorrow and next week. And I taught her not to want friends because when you have a little thing on your head that says, please like me, kids don't like that. They like, I like me. If you want to like me too, good. If you don't, you're lost. And I taught her to do that, to change her energy. She was inundated with friends. But they really respond to that word. And because children can't future pace, that's like when, a, when you're be, be, below two and the mother goes out, kids think she's not coming out. When you say, oh, my child's so greedy, I want it to wait to eat, they feel like they're never going to get fed again because they cannot future pace. And so when you're a therapist or a coach, when people to say, you know, I, I wolf down donuts, I, I mainline jelly beans, what's wrong with me? Somewhere, somehow, their parents have made them wait and wait, or remove food as a punishment. You, you don't have that because you're bad or we can't afford that. And because the child's mind thinks it's forever, they act as if it's forever, even 40 years later. So the job of the child's mind is just the same as the adult mind. It does what it thinks the child wants to do. I don't want to go to school. I'm scared of school. And now I've got all these anxiety attacks and hives and eczema. I went to a little kid who had eczema, and I said, darling, I know this is a crazy question, but if the eczema had a job, what would it be? And he said, well, when I stand like that and mommy puts the wet bandage on my eczema, he called it his sensible skin, couldn't say sensitive. He said, when she puts the bandage on my sensible skin, she shouldn't put any cream on that baby. And there it was. He told his mind as the mother did the baby, I want that. I want massage. I worked with another kid who had migraines at six. Very unusual. As if the migraine was your friend. I know that's crazy, isn't it? But if you wanted to help, you went, well, when I get migraines, mummy and daddy stop shouting. They turn off the light and we sit in the dark until it goes away. So he'd obviously said to his mind, I, I wish I could stop my parents fighting. And the mind goes, let me come up with a solution. It may be crazy, it may be harmful, but the mind doesn't do, just let me have a solution. It doesn't think, is it good, bad, helpful, unhelpful, beneficial? It's just a solution. So children tag on to these painful issues of painful experiences and you can change it by getting rid of the tagging. 
It'll always be this way. It will never change. It'll be like this for the rest of my life. You can help them incredibly. And I'm talking about but adults coming to my office and go, look, I know I'm a millionaire, but I can't spend money. I'm so worried it's going to run out. Because when they were a kid, they couldn't spend money. They didn't have it. So people hold on to this stuff. So I think we're just about out of time, but since we're talking about I'm going to tell you a very funny thing that happened to me. So I work with a lot of children, and there's nothing better. One little kid said to me, Marissa, you are the magic person, and you stopped me wetting the bed because you did magic. But all I did was tell her that when her tummy was full of wee-wee, can't say bladder, that this magic Barbie light went up to her brain, and she woke up, and she sat up, and she ran to the bathroom, and then the next day she called her grandmother and said, Grandmother, I'm dry. And then she went to sleep over. I excited her imagination. I did it several times. In 20 minutes, that kid never wet the bed again, and she said, you did magic with me. Then I worked with another kid who said, Marissa, you're so cool, you do magic. And then I worked with a big hulking kid and he went, you're the bollocks. And I thought, isn't that interesting that the words for a man's genitals, a massive compliment for a woman, it's a massive insult. <laughs> so there's your language patterns. Being the bollocks is a huge compliment. <laughs> and being the female equivalent, is a huge insult. So you have to make of words what you want to make of words. But if you use powerful words, you'll have a powerful life. If you understand the rules of the mind and put them into practice, you will be running the ship. Your, your mind is like a Ferrari. And you're like a driver trying to run that Ferrari. The subconscious is the Ferrari. The conscious is the driver. I don't even know how to run this. But if you learn, you can handle a Ferrari. Think of your mind like a Ferrari. And think of you like a hugely competent, highly skilled Ferrari driver. Take that Ferrari where you want it to go. Make your life incredible. Jealousy is nothing new. One of the Ten Commandments is about envy. And you've all heard the problem, I've got the green-eyed monster. And in England, we have a funny expression called well gel. He's well gel, or she's well gel, which means they're extremely jealous. So it's all right to feel envious. I remember someone saying to me once, I envy you because you have a baby, but she said it with immense kindness. So we've always had this word to envy other people, to feel jealous, to feel that they have more than we have, that it's not fair that some people have love and wealth and looks and we don't have that. But it's got somewhat out of hand because of social media. Everyone on social media looks amazing. It's what I call being overexposed to fake images of perfection. We look at someone and go, look at them. They've got a perfect house, a perfect life, a perfect body, a perfect partner, perfect kids. No. That's not true, but it appears that way. And so jealousy tends to stem from comparing yourself with other people. 50 years ago, it was a lot easier not to know, but now we are in someone's home. We're in their life, we're in their water, we're often in their bedroom because they tell us everything. So we have more material than ever before to compare ourselves with, and we just feel so bad. So maybe you're just about to have a baby and you're excited, but your friend is a hotshot lawyer having a baby back at work in a week, has got a perfect body, baby is perfect, and you think, oh, I, I, I felt okay, but I don't now. We feel okay until we start to compare ourselves with other people and think they're better than me. They have more than me. They're more fortunate than me. And then we feel jealous, and then the jealousy begins to consume us until some of us start checking our partner's phone, looking at other people's Facebook profiles. And jealousy is not at all confined to your intimate relationship. I'm jealous of my partner. People find them attractive. They come on to them. I, I think my partner's cheating. My partner's looking at these gorgeous women or men who are better than me. That's bad enough, but then we become jealous of our sister. My sister's always been the favorite. She can do no wrong. You know, I work really hard and my parents give her money that they don't give me because she's feckless. I'm jealous of someone at work who gets more praise than me, who's the boss's favorite. But when we peel back jealousy, what is it really all about? It's about you comparing yourself and believing that someone else 
is better than you. Jealousy feeds right into feelings of I am not enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not attractive enough. You know, many, many years ago as a single parent, and I had a neighbor who lived in my street and she was a model and she had a perfect husband. He worshiped her. She looked amazing. She had a perfect little girl who was friends with my little girl. She'd always say to me, you know, why is your little girl so bad? And I said, hey, my daughter's not bad. She's actually what's called age appropriate. You know, we're out in the park and you shout your little girl stop and she stops. And my little girl keeps going and I have to shout stop three times because she's not a dog. She doesn't come to heel. She's a normal child, but I always felt a little bit inadequate around her. She was beautiful. She had a perfect house. She had a full-time nanny and this perfect child who turned out to have some issues later. She was very, very introverted. And then her husband left her and then she got very fat. And I'm not saying that to gloat, but I remember 10 years later, she wrote to me and said, hey, you know, your life is amazing. I, I envy you. And I thought, isn't that funny? I allowed myself to feel inferior next to her because she had a perfect picture book life. Her life was like an advert. Everything was perfect, but underneath it wasn't perfect. And there was I in the background, single mother, child that wasn't perfectly behaved. And yet somehow, she managed to envy me. When I was a single parent, mothers at my daughter's would say, well, you're so lucky not having a husband. I have to go home every night and make dinner and do the laundry. Thought, Isn't that funny? They envy me. I might have envied them. Wow, you got this perfect family life, the husband, the car, the job, someone else helping with the bills, and I don't have that. It's very easy to look at someone and think, you have a perfect life, but you have no idea what is going on in someone's life. You know, many years ago, this stunningly beautiful Asian woman stepped into my office, dressed head to toe in couture. She was breathing gorgeous. My first look was, oh, I want to be you. I want to look like you and dress like you. Doesn't mean I don't love being me. And we sat down and she began to tell me her problem that she drank every day and she had to stop. And so I hypnotized her to stop drinking. And she came back and said, actually, I've got a bigger problem. Now, you know, I'm married to someone I don't love. It was an arranged marriage. He's very nice. He's immensely kind. That's the problem. He's a nice guy. And when he touches me, I want to die because I'm not attracted to him. I was made to marry him. And I can't leave him because in my culture, if I leave, he will get custody of our children. So I have to stay in this marriage for another 20 years. And the only way I can handle his touch is to drink. And I remember thinking, wow, I feel ashamed of myself. I envied her. She's immensely wealthy, beautiful, immaculate, stunning. I don't envy her anymore. I'm free to do whatever I like, to be with the person I want to be with, and to leave if I want to, and to still keep my children. So it's very easy to look at someone's life to see the exterior. They're beautiful, they're stunning, they're wealthy, they're talented, and I'm not, and I just feel inadequate in comparison. So how do you stop it? Well, you must stop comparing yourself to anyone. You are unique. There's no one in the world exactly like you. They'll never again be someone exactly like you, you're unique. You have unique qualities, you have unique gifts. And while you're busy looking at someone else, you don't know how unique you are. I'll tell you another funny story. Many years ago, one of my clients who's immensely wealthy invited me to a dinner party at her house and I duly turned up. And my friend who's an acupuncturist also turned up. And this house was just amazing. I mean, it was so stunning. When I went home, I thought, oh, I thought my house was amazing, but now I've seen hers, it doesn't feel quite so amazing. And then my friend, the acupuncturist, said, oh, hey, last night I went to that house. I was so happy to be back at my house. I, I loved being back at my house. It's normal, it's cozy, it's messy, it's real. I couldn't bear to live in a palace like that. I would hate to live like that. And sometimes I go to clients who live on gated estates with three 
layers of security. They live in kind of mansions that are so sterile. I think, oh no, I can't wait to come back to my normal house, my normal life, because I don't envy that. So you must look at, first of all, what are you envious of? Is it someone's life? Is it their body? Is it their children? Is it what you think they have? And remember that all that glistens is not gold. It may appear perfect, but it's no more perfect than your life. You see, things don't make you happy. A beautiful home, a beautiful body, a beautiful wardrobe, someone making your juices, that does not make you happy. What makes you happy are your relationships with people. That is the thing guaranteed to give you joy a real person you're having a real relationship with. And I do remember years ago being asked to visit a very, very famous movie star in her Hollywood mansion. And I went along and I went through the three layers of security, finally got to her house. She had a butler, a maid, someone doing her laundry. And I've never met anyone quite as lonely as this woman. Her husband had left her, her children were grown up, and she didn't do anything. She didn't have to shop. She didn't have to go to the dry cleaners. I thought, wow, she is more worse off than someone who worked in a bar and would go out at night with their friends, someone who worked in a store or an office, and went out every Friday night with the girls or with the other members of staff because she was disconnected her immense wealth her immense privilege made her so lonely I think she's the loneliest person I've ever met but I couldn't say to her hey you need to go out because she had staff to do everything but no love in her life and I didn't ever envy her in fact I felt immensely sorry for her and we're always looking at magazines about the latest celebrity whose relationship has gone wrong when they're supposed to have it. We look at the Kardashians and think, but that isn't real. That's not real. It's fake. So overexposure to fake images of perfection can make you feel inadequate because you're beginning the comparison. Here am I. I've got a home, got a job, got a body, got a partner, got a kid but they've got a better body, a better home, a better partner, better behaved children. So you're allowing yourself to believe something that is not true. You have no idea what is going on. Stop comparing and look at what you have. If you have love in your life, you are already immensely fortunate. If you have a home, you're fortunate. If you have money to pay your bills and put food on the table. You are fortunate someone on the other side of the world is envying you because it's all relative. When I go to Zimbabwe, I feel immensely privileged because I have a home. I have money. I can buy whatever food I want and a lot of the people I meet there really can't. So it really helps to go, wow, well, I'm envying someone who's up here Someone down here is envying me. There is only one antidote for envy and jealousy, and that is to stop comparing yourself. Yes, that person looks perfect, but who knows what is really going on? I'm me, I'm happy, I'm enough. I am enough. I accept myself for being enough. I know I'm enough. I'm worthy enough, lovable enough, good enough worthy enough just the way I am stops you feeling envy. And when you look at someone else, remember you're looking at a mirage. Yes, you're looking at Jennifer Aniston with her shiny, glossy hair and a wonderful life, but both of her marriages have failed. That's not her fault. That doesn't make her less of a person, but it means that she may be envying you you with your normal life and your laundry piling up and your kids smearing peanut butter all over the sofa, she may think, oh, I want that life. You don't know who is envying you while you are envying them. But envy is a green-eyed monster. While you're busy comparing yourself, you are diminishing yourself. You're putting yourself down. And the best way to stop being envious is this. 
every day wake up and think about what you are grateful for. Gratitude is the highest frequency you can resonate at. And when you say, I'm so grateful, I'm here, I'm grateful, I'm healthy, I'm grateful, I've got a great job, I'm grateful, I have love. Gratitude is amazing. So when I went to this millionaire's amazing house, I came home and I thought, oh, my house looks really average now. But a few months later, I took my daughter to feed homeless people in London who were sleeping under bridges. When I came home, I thought, wow, I feel like I live in a palace. I've got a bed. I've got sheets, I've got heating, I've got a fridge full of food. How lucky am I? So start off from gratitude. Every day think about what am I grateful for? I'm grateful I have kids that leave, don't put the lids on things, I go to pick up a jar and it smashes. I'm grateful I have kids. I'm grateful I have a partner who leaves their underwear on the floor. I'm grateful I have a home where something is broken. And it may sound very, very Pollyanna, but you see, whatever you focus on, you get more. When you're focusing on gratitude, I'm grateful, I'm lucky, you cannot focus on, well, they're better than me, they've got more than me. I want what they have and I can never get it. The mind cannot hold conflicting beliefs ever. It's a rule of the mind, it cannot hold conflicting beliefs, therefore, if you're focusing on what you have and how wonderful it is, you have love, you have warmth, you have real friends, you have people that want to be with you, as you focus on that, you cannot focus on what you haven't got. So focus on what you've got, be grateful for what you've got, remember you're unique, there's no one like you, there never has been before, and there never will be again and you can't compare yourself. At a wedding I was at once, I had a rather overweight cousin who was marrying a very skinny guy, and my grandmother said, well, she's found her lid. Everyone has their lid. You are someone's lid. You are someone's fantasy dream come true as a partner, as a friend, as a parent, as a colleague. You are someone's fantasy. Someone somewhere thinks you are the best thing in the whole world. See yourself through the eyes of your children or your parents or your friends or your partner. Stop comparing yourself. Be grateful. Remember, we are all flawed people, having flawed relationships with flawed people. That is the best you can ever be. And when you go, well, this is great. That's good. You mean I can be flawed? I don't have to be perfect? Yes. Being perfect is a race you enter with no finishing line ever. As you get near to it, it moves and it moves again. And I can tell you now that skipping a beat in 33 years, my clients who are the most unhappy were always the ones who try to be perfect. They were also the loneliest because people don't like that. They like warm, real people with flaws, just like you, just like me. Be yourself, be the best you can be. No comparing, no envy. You are someone's fantasy. When you know that, it changes everything. Check out my next video here and download my free self-esteem boosting workbook right here. The way you feel about anything at any time is down to two things. The pictures you make in your head, and the words you say to yourself. And number one habit to stop.